Hello, this is Dean L. Nebley with New Jersey Family Magazine, and with us today is Dr. Arthur Patinsky, a physician who has been practicing pediatric and adolescent medicine for more than 30 years, and we're lucky today that he's joining us. He's currently practicing at Atlantic Medical Group Pediatrics in Florham Park, and we're very happy to have him today to talk about the topic of scoliosis, which uh, is affecting a lot of our kids, and it's just something that we're trying to get to the bottom of how we diagnose it, how we treat it. There's been so many changes. So Dr. Bradinsky, we're really thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining us. Dina, thank you for this opportunity. So I thought we could just start with the basics of really what scoliosis is and how we go about diagnosing it. Sure. Uh, very simply, scoliosis is a curve of the spine uh, as you see it from the back. Of, uh, of the child. Um, that's in its most simplistic uh, explanation. Uh, there's a lot to that though, in that I like in speaking to parents to talk about the body symmetry. Uh, one side of the body very often resembles the other side. And in the back specifically, uh, you look at the back and the right side or the left side sort of uh, look the same. Now, um, with scoliosis, uh, that symmetry uh, won't appear. One side will look differently from the other. That could be in the height of the shoulders, it could be in the tilt of the pelvis or waist, uh, but you'll lose some of that symmetry. Now, um, symmetry um, uh, doesn't always have to be exact. Uh, you're allowed to have some degree of asymmetry. One foot could be a little bigger than the other, the shoe size. Uh, people are aware of that. Same thing with the back. So uh, when it comes to the back, you're allowed to have a little bit of asymmetry. And in testing for scoliosis, we very often find a little bit of asymmetry, and that's not a problem. Uh, about 10% of youngsters have a degree of one side not equal to the other, and that's perfectly normal. Um, but going further into it, um, it's the exact measurement of the difference of one side versus the other, for instance, that will, will make the diagnosis of scoliosis. In terms of causes, what do we know about what may or what do we not know? Do we, do we know what the causes are? No, um, there are different types of scoliosis. Uh, the common type that uh, we're referring to today is called adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. When you hear the term idiopathic in a medical sense, it means we don't have all the information, we don't know, uh, and it could be 100 years of idiopathic scoliosis, you still haven't found the specific reason. There are slight genetic tendencies. If um, one child in the family has scoliosis, 7% uh, likelihood that uh, another child in the family will have it. Th there's no direct uh, parent to child inheritance. There are some genes which seem to be more associated with it, but there's no specific inheritance pattern. Which means all the more important that we have to all be checking for it, right? So what age do we start and how exactly is it done? What should we be looking for as parents in terms of frequency of checking and what happens? Right. So parents sometimes will notice this just uh, in the summertime, uh, the youngsters uh, in a bathing suit, uh, haven't seen in a bathing suit since uh, the last summer. Oh, you look a little tilted. Oh, this shoulder, this hip, it's a little different than the other. Um, also, in New Jersey, there's a state statute where youngsters from the age of 10 to 18 get periodically checked in the school uh, for scoliosis. Uh, in a physician's office, uh, it's pretty routine that you're examining the child, the legs, the back, the spine. Uh, for that, for me, it starts when they can stand up and do a little bend and stretch, reach for the sky. How, do, how does their back look when they bend over? So uh, it starts early, but um, really uh, in the preteen into the teen years is when you really wanna uh, try to watch this. 
And what happens if you're diagnosed as a parent? You, do, should you go into panic mode? Obviously, you know, that's probably the tendency of most of us. Um, what do we do next? So, great point. So, uh, and we get this in the office, um, a panic call from a parent, they've gotten the uh, letter home from the, uh, the uh, uh, examining uh, individual at the school, very often the nurse, uh, your child has screened positive for scoliosis. Uh, think back to that symmetry I mentioned. Really all they were uh, checking for was a symmetry of the, of the spine, okay? That's not scoliosis. So uh, definitely a parent should contact the child's primary care provider, the person that knows them best. And with few exceptions, it's not an emergency. Um, and as long as there's no pain, no difficulty with movement, no pain that's waking the child up in the middle of the night, it was just found on a little bit of a screen at school, uh, we can handle that in the office. By no means a panic situation. So then let's go into treatment. And also, if you have a visual to show us of what it looks like and then what the treatment sure. process is. So uh, like. what kind of pediatrician would I be without my toys? And my apologies to my, uh, my grandson, Charlie. I borrowed some blocks. And uh, here's a nice straight spine. So in scoliosis, the vertebral bodies grow in a slightly tilted fashion. Okay, now in addition to um, the, the curve, uh, if, if we now look at a rib that's attached to that uh, vertebral body, uh, in addition to the curve that happens, there, there's also a tilt of the spine. The vertebral bodies rotate. And this is what we use as the common screening tool for scoliosis, the bend test because not only is there a curve of the vertebral bodies, there's a rotational component, and that allows us to say, oh, the ribs on one side of the body are higher than the other. So that is the bend test or Adam's bend test that's been used for years. That's the, the, the screening tool. All right. Uh, also, when we bring the youngster in, I'll, I'll be using this. It's called a scoliometer. Uh, it's a, basically a carpenter's level where you can run down the spine and um, you'll, you'll get a tilt uh, angle, okay? So, so those are the things that we're going to be do, doing in the, in the office. Uh, if we identify a youngster that has a significant appearance, uh, again, using the, the scoliometer, um, then the next step is referral. Um, to get an accurate measurement of what that asymmetry is. And the uh, standard that you use is an X-ray. So um, in this pictorial representation of what an X-ray of scoliosis looks like, you see a little bit of a curve of the spine. Um, that is measured by the radiologist or the orthopedist uh, as something called a Cobb angle. Now, uh, all the treatments, all the diagnosis, all the treatments are based on, number one, the Cobb angle, how, how much is, is the curve. Uh, Cobb angles less than 10 degrees are just called spinal asymmetry. And as I said before, that's normal. You do nothing for that. For Cobb angles that are greater than 10 degrees, depending on the age of the, the child, and most importantly, depending on the uh, physical maturation, how far they are through their puberty maturation, and how much uh, growth they have left in their bones, uh, you know, for future height, that will determine the treatment. Okay, and then so once you've, and what about physical therapy after, can you talk about that well, process? Yes, in the context of, of treatment, and it gets rather complicated because uh, the higher the degree of um, angle and the younger the child, the more aggressive you generally want to be to prevent progression of that curve, all right? Um, 
uh, although males and females, boys and girls are both affected uh, by scoliosis, the girls much more likely will progress further. So if you have a uh, early pubertal girl just starting puberty and she's got a 20 degree angle when you first uh, discover it, they're like much more likely to present uh, a problem and need treatment than uh, that same 20 degree angle in a 16 or 17 year old girl. Now, as far as the therapy, the, the physical therapy and bracing are the early treatments. If you have a, a mild curve and uh, your, your growth is nearly finished, you might be able to get away with just physical therapy. But again, it's, it's very individualized and, and that's why you, you need to get an expert in the field. Once you've identified it as significant, you, you really have to uh, follow it closely. The most common treatment is just observation. If, if I had a uh, middle school and high school with a thousand youngsters there, okay, the incidence of true scoliosis, the curve more than 10 degrees, uh, of those thousand, only 30 are going uh, to have scoliosis. And of those 30, only three are going to need intervention, all right? So as you said, although parents deal with it uh, regularly, the incidence of severe scoliosis requiring intervention is, is much less. When you say intervention, I assume then surgery is probably really rare, right? Surgery is the most ex extreme. Um, you know, there's observation, there's physical therapy, bracing is the mainstay of treatment still. Um, and then if the curve is still progressing while you're doing other therapy, surgery uh, becomes an option. And lastly, as you, after intervention or after you've, after you've diagnosed, um, what does the follow-up look like? Just checking up to make sure, you know, a year down the line, say I've been, my child's been diagnosed and now she's 20, 25. What do you follow? How do you follow up? Does it change with age? It used to be thought, again, since it's more common in uh, girls, that the women would have more significant problems as they got older with potential pregnancies and things like that. That really in the, the newer uh, thought processes haven't really gone on that much uh, where you have to follow uh, the adults uh, very far. And most all kids, uh, as they get to be uh, young adults, uh, are discharged from orthopedic care. There's a very few that need constant um, referral uh, through their uh, early adult years. Much less common um, with uh, the, the newer ways of, of fo following uh, the scoliosis curves. Well, this is all comforting and it's definitely, I'm sure, calmed a lot of us who had concerns about this. Um, and it's been very helpful, Dr. Pinsky. We really appreciate your time. Um, so if a parent has, what should their next step be in general? If they, right. if they contact have, their uh, primary care uh, provider, uh, we'll know the child best. We, we have growth charts. We can assess their physical maturation. Uh, we'll assess it. Uh, sometimes it's just a mild asymmetry. And again, these are screening tests. So the school uh, wants to be extra cautious and they're gonna refer things which are borderline. And that's what they should do. We'll take over, we'll assess the youngster if it needs an X-ray, if, if an X-ray is needed for the child, if uh, a consultant or specialist is needed, um, we're lucky in New Jersey to have many pediatric uh, orthopedic um, uh, specialists or uh, uh, spine and spinal deformity, scoliosis centers where we can refer the kids. 
that's really helped. So basically it always starts with your pediatrician. That's the most important message. And just a shout out to Atlantic Health for being such a valuable partner. You can go to atlantichealth.org in general for more information. Thank you again for your expertise, your guidance, your visual um, that really helped us understand. Um, thank you, Dr. Patinsky.